For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Kings 19, 1 through 18. You can follow along in your Red Pew Bible or on the screen. But let us take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts for the hearing of God's word. First Kings 19, 1 through 18. This is God's word for us this morning. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, 
I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meheloa, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. All the knees that have not bowed to bow to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Elijah's life up to this point has been filled with spectacle. He declared a drought in the land due to Ahab's faithlessness. He lived in the wilderness and was fed by ravens. He lived with a widow whose jar of meal miraculously never ran dry. God used him to bring a young man back to life. He had a very public confrontation with the prophets of Baal and saw God rain down fire on the altar that he had built, proving that Yahweh is God over all the world. He then participated in the slaughter of the prophets of Baal. And then as we read today, Jezebel heard of the slaughter of the prophets of Baal and vowed to kill Elijah. So Elijah flees to the wilderness, there is fed by an angel, survives for 40 days and 40 nights from that one meal, or two meals, and then arrives at Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, the place where Moses received the two tablets, where the covenant was ratified. And there God speaks to Elijah and asks what he's doing. And Elijah laments, I've done so much for God. God's people have forsaken the covenant. I'm alone left and they want to kill me. Elijah is done. At this point in Elijah's life, he has primarily seen God work in the realm of the spectacle. His ministry has been marked by one miracle after another. One mighty act of God followed by another mighty act of God. And so when Elijah steps to the mouth of the cave and hears a great wind, he expects, and we do too, that God is going to be in another spectacle. But God wasn't in the wind. There's a giant earthquake, causes the rocks to shake. Surely this spectacle will house God's presence. But no, God wasn't in the earthquake. And there's a fire, just like the one that God rained down on the altar. But God wasn't in the fire. It's when the sound of silence pierces Elijah's ears and soul that he recognizes God's presence. In the absence of sound, there is a fullness of God's presence. And God speaks to Elijah in the silence. There is a tragedy, I think, to this story. 
God speaks to Elijah in the silence, but he doesn't hear it. When God asks him what he's doing there, Elijah just repeats his complaint, word for word. Israel has forsaken God. Elijah alone is left. He is so burned out that he cannot receive God in the silence. And God relieves Elijah of his duty. God instructs him to go and appoint his successor, Elisha. And then God reminds Elijah, I've kept a remnant. 7,000 that have not bowed to Baal. God, in a sense, says to Elijah, I've been working in the background, in the silence. I've been working unseen, completely apart from you. Elijah had come to assume that God only worked in the spectacle, and he failed to see God's silent work. Our lives are marked by spectacle. We are bombarded with image upon image, with more shows, more content, bigger and brighter and better. Or we are flooded with information and expected to keep up with everything that is happening in the world. We are glued to the news, waiting for the next headline to give us a little dose of dopamine when it pops up on our phone. We carry spectacle factories in our pockets and purses. So that if we have a moment to ourselves, well, we're never truly alone, but can be connected to someone at the press of a button. Our lives, like Elijah, are marked by spectacle after spectacle, and we, like Elijah, are tired. What's different about Elijah's life is that many of the spectacles he experienced came from the hand of God. God was in the spectacle, and God is also in the silence. But Elijah's imagination had been so shaped by spectacle that when God ministered to Elijah in and through silence, he did not know how to receive it. I want to be clear, God is in both spectacle and silence. This is not an oppositional idea. But a correction, a balance is needed when we swing too hard in one direction over the other. Our culture and world has swung hard into the spectacle, and so we need a correction. And silence is that correction. So this morning, I want to offer three ways that an overemphasis on spectacle impacts us and how silence helps break an overreliance on spectacle. And as a fun little treat, each couplet will start with the same letter. I bet you've never seen a pastor do that before. Here at Park, we like to really lean into innovative communication strategies. <laughs> Spectacle leads to hubris. Yeah. Silence mm -hmm. leads to humility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Elijah, when he speaks to God, is self-focused. I've been zealous for the Lord. I alone am left. They're trying to take my life. Elijah has come to think that it's all on his shoulders. And even after God meets him in the silence, he repeats his claim. It's almost as if Elijah has come to identify himself with the spectacle. That it all happened because of him. And there's a temptation for us to identify ourselves with spectacle. For our ego to be wrapped up and even to take credit for what happens in the world. We start to think that it's because of us that something out there is happening. This is why sports fans put their hats on inside out, because surely that's going to make a difference in the game. <laughs> Spectacle leads to pride, an overinflated sense of self. Silence, on the other hand, is, as philosopher Max Picard said, it's useless. Silence does not fit into the world of profit or utility, it simply is. And it seems to have no other purpose. It cannot be exploited. When we stop and are silent, we discover that the world keeps spinning. God continues to hold everything together. And we really don't have much of a part to play. We're quite small. But the good news is that God loves small things. Silence reminds us of our place in God's world. 
and we are humbly, when we are silent, put in our proper place. Spectacle severs our awareness of our past. Silence gives us perspective. When the angel instructs Elijah to journey into the wilderness, there is this incredible resonance with Israel's story. Elijah is fed by God in the wilderness. Elijah survives 40 days, 40 nights, that number 40, on what God provides, much like Israel survived on manna that God provided. Elijah goes to Mount Horeb, also known as Sinai, the same place where God established the covenant with Israel. God passes by Elijah, Elijah while he's in the mouth of the cave. God passed by Moses in the cleft of a rock. God reenacts Israel's story in Elijah's life. It's as if God is reminding Elijah that his conflict with Ahab and Jezebel takes place in a much larger narrative. God had brought Israel out of Egypt by a mighty hand and called them as God's own special possession. God was faithful back then. And God, in leading Elijah to reenact Israel's story, is reminding Elijah that God will be faithful now. God's past faithfulness is a promise of God's present faithfulness. God is reminding Elijah that the story is much bigger than him. But Elijah misses it. The spectacle has clouded his vision. The spectacle tells us that all that matters is now. This moment, this news, this event. Don't think about the future. Don't think about the past. Now, now, now. There is a constancy to the demands of now that is never satisfied. And if you stop and try to take a break, maybe opt out for a moment, well then you're shamed for not being informed. And so we keep our attention glued to this moment, our vision ever narrowing. Let me just say this. Anyone who claims that this is the most important moment in history, these are the most consequential events, or that we need to throw off the burden of ancient ways, is speaking nonsense. They are claiming to have a vantage point, a moral authority, and an insight into all of time and history that only belongs to God. To say such things that we, this moment is the most important, is to speak with a hubris and a myopic vision that comes from the spectacle. Augustine famously taught there is only one turning point in history, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And everything else is second fiddle. Silence, on the other hand, gives us perspective. In silence, our minds slow down, our thoughts can drift, and we can remember. In silence, we recall that much of the important things in life actually happen unseen and unknown. Christ's resurrection, the moment that his heart started to beat again, unseen. No one saw that moment. It happened in the silence of the tomb. No one saw the event, but we saw the effects. And so too, there is much that God does in silence. God is working out a story in this world that is so much bigger than us. And we do a much better job of engaging with the world, of loving the world that God has made, when we live with the perspective that God holds it all and that there is more than just this moment. Finally, spectacle leads to burnout. Silence leads to a deeper sense of being. After all the spectacle, Elijah is burnt out. He hears that Jezebel wants to kill him, and so he runs at first. It seems to save his life. But then he goes and takes a nap under a tree and wakes up and asks to die. Apparently he wasn't afraid of death, he just was afraid of death at someone else's hand. He wants to die on his own terms. And when God appears to Elijah in the silence, he can't receive the gift that God is giving in that silence because he is so caught up with everything he's been through. Spectacle is exciting and fun and a necessary part of life, and too much of it burns us out. 
the demand to perform, to stay informed, to watch all of the new amazing TV shows, to listen to every thoughtful podcast, to keep up with everything around us, it is exhausting. And we are exhausted. And our souls continue to shrivel and shrink. But in silence, we are grounded in ourselves, in the world, and most importantly, in God. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've come to find that there is something tangible, actually, to silence. It's not an absence. It's invisible, but tangible, real, though unseen. I, I found in my own life that I can tell a palpable difference in myself in my days if I start the morning with a period of silence. 10, 15 minutes of silence rooted in God's presence has more impact on my day than anything else. Maybe you've experienced that too. There are gifts that God gives us that only come through silence. The sweetness of God's presence that is discovered in silence. Again, I want to reiterate that God is in both the spectacle and silence. This is not an either or type of thing. These are not oppositional. But our world has swung so far into obsession, being enamored with the spectacle, that we need a correction, and silence is that antidote. So if you this morning are feeling overwhelmed, burnt out, caught up in the primacy of now, or feel like life is just filled with noise, turn it off. Take a break. Silence, great thing, is like breath, it's free. No subscriptions, no annual fees, it's just there. And when we enter into the silence, we find that God has been waiting all along, welcoming us with open arms, saying, come, enjoy this moment, enjoy this time. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you know what we need more than we do ourselves. We thank you that you minister to us in big and mighty ways, that you work in this world that defies our imagination and our dreams. And you also work in the smallest, simplest, and subtle ways. So God, as we are often excited to receive your gift in spectacle, we also give us the strength to receive your gift in silence. May we discover your welcome and your embrace in those moments where we sit with you and allow your presence in the silence to do good work of renewal and restoration. We pray this in Christ's name. Please rise in body or in spirit in singing, How Great Thou Art. If you'd like to follow along in the dark blue hymnal, um, it's number one, I'm sorry, it's number 467. Thank you. 
to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forever. Amen. We invite you to join us for a sermon discussion. We'll be over in the cafe, which is kind of through the gym, but uh, for now, at the end of our service, enjoy one another's fellowship uh, and continue your worship in relationship with one another. And as we go, receive this blessing. The Lord bless you.